the federal bureaucracy or the agencies and departments of the federal government. These are the agencies and departments that actually run the federal government. Which branch do they belong to? Which of the three branches do they belong to? They are part of the executive branch. And who is their leader? Uh, the president of the United States. Their main job is to execute or enforce policy. That's their main job. They take policy from the policymakers and they enforce them and they make sure that they are implemented and executed to a T. So they are from, they are they belong to the executive branch and their job is to implement and enforce policy. Policy can come from any of the three branches of government. It can come from Congress, which it usually does. It can come from the courts, or it can even come from the, their boss themselves, which would be the President of the United States. So policy, if you're confused about what policy means, policy is any decision made by government. What kind of policy does Congress usually make? They make laws, they make legislation. On your tests, on your FRQ part, a lot of you miss out on points because you told me that federal courts can make legislation or the president can make legislation. They cannot. Only Congress can do that. Congress, congressional laws have to be enforced and implemented by the federal bureaucracy. So Congress creates the laws and those laws are um, given to a federal bureaucracy, to an agency or department for them to implement. From the federal courts, what do they make? They don't make any laws. What do they, what do, they do? They make what? They make rulings and they make decisions. All those rulings and decisions have to be enforced by the federal bureaucracy as well. So federal courts like the Supreme Court of the United States, they hand out a ruling or they hand out a decision, which are the same thing, and those decisions have to be enforced, and the federal bureaucracy is the one that enforces those decisions. From the President of the United States, what does the federal bureaucracy do for the President? Uh, the, president, uh, the President of the United States can make decisions or they can make executive orders, for example, and those executive orders have to be carried out by the federal bureaucracy. Any law coming from Congress, any decision made by the courts, any ruling made by the courts, any executive order given by the President of the United States, somebody needs to execute them, and that is the job of the federal bureaucracy. The federal bureaucracy executes and enforces policy. Any law passed by Congress, any ruling or decision made by the courts, any executive order hand out and issued by the President of the United States, any action that the President wants to take, all of those have to be executed and enforced or implemented by the federal bureaucracy. Any questions? So again, in a nutshell, when Congress makes a law, it is up to the federal bureaucracy to execute it. When the President comes up with an executive order, an executive agreement, or a decision, the federal bureaucracy executes it. When the federal courts makes a ruling or makes a decision, it is up to the federal bureaucracy to execute or implement those decisions. Any questions? At the end, please remind me to give me your printed note. But the federal bureaucracy is in charge of implementation and execution. They enforce all of these policies created by these policymakers. They don't necessarily make policy themselves. Their job is to execute and enforce policies that are being made by Congress, the President, and the federal courts. Which one of these do they commonly execute? Congress. Congress. Legislation is the, the one that they commonly execute. Any questions so far? So, once a policy is made, maybe by Congress through a law, or maybe by the president through an, exec an executive order, or by the courts through a ruling or a decision, that policy is given to an agency or a department for them to execute. The responsibility of execution and implementation of a policy is then assigned to a department or an agency. If the policy is about, for example, food, who, does it, who, do, who do we give it to? We give it to the, if the FDA. If it's about education, who do we give it to? The Department of what? Education. The Department of Education. So if Congress today makes a law about education, the implementation of that law, the implementation of that legislation is assigned to the Department of Education for them to implement it and enforce it. Any questions? When Donald Trump issued his travel ban, he assigned that executive order to the Department of Transportation, for example. <coughs> So, uh, policy is assigned to an agency, and the responsibility of that agency is to meet the policy goal, whatever goal that policy is trying to, is trying to achieve. The 
that this is the job of the bureaucracy. They take policy and they execute them and they implement them, they enforce them. Question, what if there is no agency or department that is equipped to implement or enforce a particular policy? What do we do? We make a new agency. Who can do that? Congress. Congress has the ability to create new departments and new agencies. Um, if a policy is made and there's no agency or department equipped enough to be able to achieve that power, implement that policy, then we create a new agency or we create a new department. But isn't the president in charge of the federal He is. So why but Congress is the one that makes agencies and departments. But I know what you mean. So if no agency exists, a new one gets created. Like in the 1950s, Congress and the president came up with a policy, we're going to beat the Soviets to the moon. But there were no agencies or departments that had that job before, so what did they do? They created NASA. They created NASA. And NASA was established as an agency of the federal government. Any questions? Moving on. So there's different types of federal bureaucracies. There's three categories that you need to know. The top dogs of the federal bureaucracy are the cabinet departments. There are 15 of them in the United States federal bureaucracy. If you get appointed to this position, you're one of the heads of one of these departments. So cabinet departments, there are 15 of them. They're known as departments. They're usually multi-million dollar departments with, uh, with thousands of employees. Department of Energy, Department of Education, Department of Defense, Department of State. There's 15 of them all together. Anyone know what's the last one that got established? 9-11, Homeland Security was established. Department of Homeland Security. These departments, all 15 of them, are led by somebody appointed by who? By the President of the United States, with whose approval? With the Senate's approval, what do we call these leaders of our department? Anybody know? Department. Secretary. They're called secretaries. Um, each leader that is appointed as the head of these departments are known as secretaries. So, for example, what do we call the leader of Department of Defense? Secretary of Defense. The Secretary of Defense. Uh, the leader of Department of State? Secretary of State. So they're led by secretaries or cabinet secretaries. But they are in charge of their multi-million, um, thousands of employees, their departments. Except for one department, we don't call, we don't call him a, a secretary. The Department of Justice, their leader is not known as the Secretary of Department of Justice. Uh, their leader is known as the Attorney General. The Attorney General. All right, so what are the responsibilities of a secretary? Their first and foremost responsibility is they're in charge of their own department. They're the leader of their department. Multi-million dollar departments, some are more influential than others, but a lot, but most of them have thousands of employees working for them. So they're in charge of their own department and their own policy area. And number two, as a secondary role for secretaries, from time to time, they're asked by the President of the United States to gather together, so it's called the cabinet they're to gather together and advise the President of the United States. So they have an advisory role to the President. So the President, when he needs advice about certain things, he can turn to his cabinet secretaries for that advice. But again, that's not what they usually do. What they usually do is they're busy operating and leading their own departments. So this is at the top of the top of the federal bureaucracy. So they lead their own department and they also advise the president from time to time. Now, the secretaries all have different influence on the president. Some of them the president care really much about what their opinions are. Some of them he doesn't care. This depends on the person. All right. And then the second category are in the federal bureaucracy, there's this agencies and commissions that exist. There's hundreds of them, agencies and commissions. They're in charge of a specific policy area. In charge of a specific policy area. Uh, 
Like, for example, what's NASA's policy area? Space exploration. What's the CIA's policy area? Like intelligence gathering. That's their policy area. So all these agencies and all these, um, all these commissions that exist in the federal bureaucracy, they're in charge about a certain thing. They also have a regulatory function where they regulate a certain industry of the economy. So some of these agencies and commission, they regulate. What does regulate mean? Control. They make what? Rules. So they regulate a certain sector of the economy. A certain sector of the economy. They make rules for a certain sector of the American economy or the American system. Like for example, the Environmental Protection Agency, what kind of rules do they make? Regulations about what? Protecting the environment. How about the FDA, what kind of regulations do they make? Regulations about what? Food and drugs. How about the FCC? Anybody know what the FCC stands for? They're the Federal Communications Commission. So they're in charge of TV and radio. So they make rules about what you can say on TV, what can you get away with on TV. So TV and radio for the FCC. So they make rules for a certain sector of the American economy. Regulations. Any questions? So if you see a TV show or they're playing a movie in the TV show and they censor a word, that's probably from the FCC. And if they like censor or ban a episode of Family Guy, that was the FCC. <laughs> Any questions so far? The so first category is cabinet department. Second category are the different agencies and commissions. The third category are government corporations. Government corporations. Government corporations are different in that they are run for profit. Some of them don't rely on taxpayer money to operate. They're like companies. They're like Amazon or Walmart. They run by themselves, usually. The difference between a private company and a government corporation is, think of government corporations as like companies like Amazon, only who owns them? The government does. We do. We own them. Government owns these corporations and companies. Give me the most famous one that some of you may or may have not used your entire life. Sorry? These are corporations owned by the government, companies owned by the government, and they provide a certain service. Google is not the government owned. Wish. It's the most famous one. There you go. The USPS, the United States Postal Service, is considered a government corporation. It's run by the government. Do you need to pay for the service? No. Yes, you do. Oh, what, do you need to, you need, what do you need to do? Oh, you buy stamps. You buy stamps in order to send mail through um, the USPS. So they are run like a private company, but they're owned by the government. They're kind of, like for example, USPS is like FedEx and UPS, but it's owned by the government. It's usually not very efficient. Other, um, other companies owned by the government is Amtrak. Amtrak provides train services, subways, and stuff like that for big cities. And if you guys paid attention to Luna or Bolero last year, um, the Tennessee Valley Authority, that's also a government corporation that was formed during the Great Depression. Do we need an example? No. You should probably know USPS in the back of your head, though, so that you, you know what government corporations are. The United States Postal Service. You don't know what USDS is. All right. Second thing today is how do you become employed as a federal bureaucrat? How do you become employed by one of these in departments or one of these agencies? Chances are, according to statistics, one of you in this class would work for the government and become a part or employee of one of these agencies or one of these departments, and you will work as a bureaucrat. Oh, by the way, any person that works with a federal bureaucracy in an agency or a department, we call them civil servants because they serve the people, or bureaucrats because they're part of the federal bureaucracy. So when I say bureaucrats, when I say civil servant, that means employees of the federal government, the people that work for the federal bureaucracy. Employees of the federal government. So the way that they hire and promote people through the federal bureaucracy have changed over the years. 
The key date that you need to remember is 1877. This is the date where things really changed. Before 1877, most of the bureaucratic jobs that are, the, that are in the federal bureaucracy were given based on what we call political patronage, or the patronage system. This was started by, hopefully, a president that you all know, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson comes into office, and as the President of the United States, what do you know? He can do what? Appoint. He can appoint a lot of these people to the federal bureaucracy. The thing about it is, before 1877, most of the jobs in the federal bureaucracy were appointed by the President of the United States. And some of these appointments don't need whose confirmation. They don't need Senate, only the higher level ones needed confirmation from the Senate, but the lower level ones, he can just appoint whoever he wants. So Andrew Jackson finds himself the President of the United States in 1832, and he decides to do what? He starts appointing his friends to these federal bureaucratic positions. This is what we call the patronage system. So the patronage systems operate like this. President of the United States uh, rewards his loyal supporters who gave him support or maybe gave him money during his campaign with what? Job. Job. Government jobs, bureaucratic jobs. That is the patronage system in a nutshell. You reward your friends, people that you are connected with, people who contributed to you during your campaign for president with government jobs. Yes. How do you remove them? These people? Don't they go in the the President of the United States can fire them. Oh, okay, so they can't. Yeah. No, they don't leave right away when a new president gets in there. The new president can, can decide to keep them if he wanted to. But usually, they're out of there. So, most of the bureaucratic jobs before 1877 were appointed by the President of the United States, and he was, they usually do the patronage system in which he, has, he hires people that he has connections with, people that help him during his campaign. Who can limit patronage somewhat? Who can limit this system somewhat? The Senate. The Senate can because of their what power? The ability to the ability to what? Give their consent or confirm, right? So the Senate can limit this a little bit, but for the most part, a lot of the appointments were made based on patronage, based on connections, based on how much you gave to the President of the United States during his campaign. Sir, what year did you say? 1977. This is before 1977. This is what presidents are doing. They're filling the federal bureaucracy with their friends, people that contributed to their campaigns, because most of those bureaucratic jobs, the president was given the power to appoint. So what was the result of all of this? What's the result? More qualified, qualified people. Well, unqualified people, which made the federal bureaucracy very ineffective. So the result is an ineffective federal bureaucracy because these agencies and these departments are being run by people who are not qualified to do their job. Somebody can get appointed based on his connection with the President of the United States that doesn't know anything about the agency, about what the agency is supposed to do. So the result is an ineffective federal bureaucracy. So for most of the 1800s, that was the case. The federal bureaucracy was a laughing stock in the United States because they were inefficient, they were ineffective, the people that were in charge didn't know what they were doing. Any questions so far? Anybody know what happened in 1877? Standardized testing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean, but not yet. What changed all this? So the, what changed all this is an assassination of a president. Not yet. <laughs> 1877. Grover Cleveland, President of the United States, gets assassinated. And when they, they questioned the assassin afterwards, he said, I was promised a what? I was promised a job. He didn't give me one. I got angry and I shot him. Congress said, we have to change this. We can't let the patronage system go on. Nobody respects the federal bureaucracy. The federal bureaucracy is not doing anything that's good. So we need to change the patronage system, and we need to res uh, change it with something that is better. So in 1877, they passed what we call the Pendleton Civil Service Act. The patronage system is going to give way to a new kind of system called the merit system. After the assassination of Grover Cleveland, you don't need to know that history, but you, need, you do need to know the Civil Service Act, the Pendleton Civil Service Act. You don't even need to know the date. The purpose is to limit what? 
um, for patronage, the spoil system. So the purpose is to limit patronage, to make sure that the jobs in the federal bureaucracy are not just being given out based on your connection with the president or based on your contributions to his campaign. So to limit patronage, they passed this law, the Civil Service Act. The Civil Service Act created the civil service system, which is going to change everything for the federal bureaucracy, and hopefully it's going to make it better. The patronage system is replaced with what we call the merit system. So here's what you need to know, the difference in the federal bureaucracy before 1877 and after 1877. Before 1877, most of the bureaucratic jobs, even the lower level positions, were appointed by who again? by the President of the United States. The civil service system is going to take that away from him. He's no, most of the, the majority of the jobs in the federal bureaucracy nowadays is not appointed by the President. He's only limited to the heads of agencies and the heads of departments. But those lower level jobs, he cannot touch. He doesn't have influence over those lower level jobs. So, Merritt, now, most of the jobs in the federal bureaucracy, most of the promotions and the hirings that happen in the federal bureaucracy will be based on merit. What does merit mean? Skill. Your skill, your experience, your qualification, your education. And I think Greg was alluding to something. What else? How will you go on the test? So in the federal bureaucracy, there's this, call, this thing called civil service tests or civil service exams where they test bureaucrats. Um, and you can get appointed, or you can get hired to a position based on how well you do on these tests. So most of the jobs in the federal bureaucracy now, instead of being appointed by the President of the United States, they are now given based on your skill, based on your expertise, and based on how well you do on the civil service exams. That's what the merit system is about. Any questions? All right. And it's very difficult. Number two, the civil service system this is important, makes it difficult to fire or demote a bureaucrat. Makes it difficult to fire and demote a bureaucrat. Why? Because what they noticed before 1877, before this law was passed, when a new president comes to town, what does he do? Fire. He starts firing people that doesn't agree with him, people that are not from his party, and replaces them with people that agree with him and the people from his party. So nowadays, most of the lower level bureaucratic jobs are protected from getting fired. It's very difficult to fire them. You actually need to prove that they're not doing a very good job. Here's, here's a reason that you can't use. I'm firing that guy because he's a Democrat. Or I'm firing that guy because of Republican. You can't use that anymore. You have to prove that they're not doing their job properly. So firings and demotions of bureaucrats, extremely difficult. Extremely difficult today. So if you want a safe and steady job, federal bureaucracy, it's hard to get fired. Although when the government shuts down, then Bless you. you're out of a job. All right. But it doesn't mean the president loses completely all his power. Presidential appointments are still reserved or are limited to what? To the heads of agencies. He can still fire those guys and hire them whenever he wants. So he still has some influence, he still maintains some influence over the federal bureaucracy, but he doesn't have the power that he used to have, where he can just hire and fire whoever he wants. So presidential appointments are limited to the heads of agencies and the heads of departments. To the heads, to the leaders of each agency and head. What happens when they get fired if they don't get out of the job because they work on You mean the heads? Yeah. No, they get, yeah. Can they really get in? If, if the, the agency wants them in. But usually you're too embarrassed to. Next, uh, what's the result of the civil service system? What does the E stand for? It's going to enhance what? Efficiency. Bureaucracy. Efficiency. Efficiency. I'm looking for the word expertise. Expert. Expertise is going to be much higher because of this. But efficiency also because they're more expert, more expert in what they do now. So the expertise and professionalism of the federal bureaucracy is going to increase. It's not being run by incompetent, unqualified um, cronies by the president anymore. Most of the bureaucrats there are good at what they do. The Department of Health is filled with former what? 
doctors and nurses, the Department of Education is filled with principals and teachers. It's about qualifications, it's about expertise now. And then it's going to allow the agencies to specialize, to be good at what they do. So it's going to allow them to specialize at that one policy area that they're supposed to be in charge of. And perhaps one of the biggest things about the civil service system is it's going to create more neutrality. It used to be when you have a Republican president in charge, the bureaucrats do what the Republicans want. But nowadays they make decisions in an unbiased, unpartisan way, or nonpartisan way. So there's going to be more neutrality. They're unbiased, they're nonpartisan usually in the federal bureaucracy. When they're making a decision, they don't have to consider whether or not the president likes it or not, whether the Republican or the Democrat likes it, because their job is protected, because they're not hired or fired by the president of the United States. They can make decisions without considering political parties, without considering ideologies. Any questions? What is the P sign? Professionalism. What was for your specialization? They, they can focus on what they're supposed to be in charge of. So specialization means they can focus. Neutrality means they can make decisions in an unbiased way. Because they don't have to worry about what the president thinks or what a party thinks. They can make decisions their own way. Any questions? So the question is, and hopefully everybody should know the answer, whose influence is limited by the civil service system? The president. The president. He doesn't have as much control as he used to have on the federal bureaucracy and how laws and policies are implemented because he can't hire most of those people anymore. He can't fire them um, anymore. He's only relegated to being able to influence the heads of the agencies, but for the most part, the lower level ones, he cannot touch anymore. So his influence is greatly limited. Is it completely gone in the federal bureaucracy? No, he still has an important power of appointing who? The heads. And the heads decide what direction is an agency going to go to. So it's not completely gone, but it's extremely limited from what it was before 1877. So what does the federal bureaucracy actually do? What does an agency actually do? Some of them, they do an important job of, we talked about this already, writing and enforcing regulations. What are regulations again? Rules. Writing and enforcing regulations. Not only do they come up with them, they also enforce their own regulations. And the thing that you need to know about these regulations is they carry the force of what? Force of law. They're not laws, but you still need to obey them. If a company refuses to obey the EPA's regulations, there's going to be consequences for that company. That's why we call these regulations administrative law. They're known as administrative law. Administrative law. So the EPA makes regulations about the environment. Anybody know what the FEC does, the Federal Election Commission does? We'll talk about that more later on. Aren't they in charge of like, elections? Like, like, they make regulations about elections, like how much you can spend on a candidate or how much can you advertise on TV. In 2020, the FEC is going to be center stage because they have to make sure all these candidates are obeying the rules and they're obeying the regulations of elections in the United States. So they make election laws, or I'm sorry, election regulations, not laws, regulations. What is it, Governor? Administrative law. And put law in quotations because they're not like a regular law Congress passes, but they carry the force of it. There's consequences. All right? So to enforce their ruling, I mean, their regulations, they can issue fines and punishment to somebody who's not compliant. So they can issue fines and punishment. So all these laws being, I'm sorry, all these regulations being imposed by the FDA, if a company violates it, then they can be issued a fine by the FDA. I'll tell you a little secret, hopefully. Um, fast food companies, the FDA has a regulation in which they have to state um, to a degree of, of confidence, a degree of accuracy, how much calories is in each one of their food items. And if they stretch it too far, they can get fined. So if they lie or stretch it 
truth too far, they can get fined by the FDA. But these companies are making so much money that they just choose to what? Right. They choose to pay the fine. So you should be aware that when you go to, do, to these restaurants and these fast food places, a lot of them are not compliant with the FDA rules and the calorie content that they post on there is probably fake. And they just choose to absorb the fine. Because they're going to make more money lying than actually following the regulations. All right. But the difference between the policymakers like Congress and the president and the federal courts with the federal bureaucracy, what's the difference? What do these guys have that these guys may not have? They have the power to enforce. They have the power to enforce. What else? They have what? Because of the civil service system, what does the federal bureaucracy have now? Qualifications. Qualifications. What else? So that's what is E. They have expertise, and that's what they do. They provide expertise. They provide expertise. Congress and the president may say, we want to go to the moon, but do they necessarily know how to get there? No, but who does? NASA does. The agency does. So the policymakers may not know how to achieve a certain policy. What the federal bureaucracy provides is the expertise in order to meet that policy. So they can provide expertise. Anybody know what's going on here? Where's this at? What does this look like? This is Congress, and what are they doing? They're getting sworn in. This is a committee hearing. This is a hearing for a committee. Remember, when a bill gets proposed, where does it go? It goes to a committee, they talk about it, they bring in what? Experts, and who's probably a good idea to bring in during these hearings? Somebody from a what? from a department or an agency. If, there, if, if the bill is about education, you should probably bring in the leaders of what? The Department of Education. If it's about space, then bringing somebody from NASA so that they can provide their expertise so that they can decide whether or not the bill is a good idea or not. Because the congressman may not have the expertise. You all remember the video that I let you watch about global warming and it was the House Science Committee, right? They brought in a scientist from the White House. That's one of the federal bureaucrats that they brought in. So they, they often testify in congressional hearings to provide their expertise. So they testify in congressional hearings. When they're talking about a bill, they testify in congressional hearings. All right. So we all know that their job is to implement policy. To implement laws passed by Congress, implement decisions made by the president, implement rulings made by the courts. But you need to know how they do that. What kind of power do they have in order to implement and enforce policy? They have two powers that you need to remember. Number one, discretion. Sorry. Number one, the regulatory authority. And number two, discretionary authority. You don't know how to spell that? Number one, rulemaking authority or regulatory authority. Rulemaking authority. In order to enforce or implement a policy, a federal bureaucracy is often given the ability to create rules and regulations. They have rulemaking authority. Rulemaking authority. What do we call these rules again that they come up with? We call them regulations. We call them regulations. So, Congress or the President or the federal courts makes a policy. They give that they give the responsibility of meeting the policy goal to a certain agency or a certain department. And then that agency creates rules in order to achieve that goal. And hopefully, it does achieve that goal. So I'll give you an example. So let's say tomorrow, Congress makes a law. This is a policy, right? It's a legislation. The law wants to achieve lower obesity in the United States. So it wants to decrease obesity rates in the United States. It assigns this legislation, this law, to the FDA. How do you achieve this goal? If you're the FDA, you create what? You create rules, you create regulations. So give me a regulation that they can impose on businesses that can maybe lower obesity rates in the United States. Come up with your own regulation. 
to the cap on calories. No more lying. Maybe you <laughs> put a cap on how much calories you can have in food stuff. Or maybe you could put a cap on sugar, for example, for food, right? That could be a regulation. Is that going to meet the goal? Maybe. What else? Yeah. Um, more calories. Sorry? <laughs> they can also maybe um, require can dump companies to put their calories on, on their labels, which they do nowadays. So they create regulations, they create rules in order to achieve the goal. Anybody have any questions on that? All right. I'll give you another one. In the, 1880, the 1980s, car companies were not required to provide people with seat belts. So a car company can make a car without a seat belt in it. But then groups started complaining to the government that a lot of car crashes uh, ended up with deaths because people were, are not wearing seat belts and a lot of these car companies are not providing seat belts. Um, so Congress makes a law and it assigns that task to the Department of what? Cars, transportation, Department of Transportation. And the Department of Transportation made a rule, made a regulation that all cars have to come with a what? Seat seat belt, so that they can achieve the goal. Any questions? But that is rulemaking authority. In order to achieve the goal of a policy, they are given the ability to create rules or regulations. Who can check this? The judiciary. What can the judiciary do with a regulation? They can declare it unconstitutional and they can strike a regulation down. So, for example, if Congress tomorrow makes a law that says we need to reduce carbon emissions by 50%, the EPA, the agency that's going to be in charge of implementing that policy, can make a regulation that says we're going to kill all Mexicans living in the United States so that we can reduce carbon emissions. What's going to happen? Someone's going to complain, and then the Supreme Court's going to do what? Declare it unconstitutional. It's probably not even going to reach the Supreme Court. It's going to be in the lower court. Does that make sense? So the regulations that they make can be declared unconstitutional by the federal courts. So they can check those regulations. Any questions so far? I feel like people are confused. Good. So that's one. So in order to enforce a policy, they have rulemaking authority. They can create rules. Another authority that they're given is discretionary authority. Discretionary authority. I'll give you the definition. So you can write it down. I need you to follow along. Discretionary authority is the ability of an agency, the ability of an agency to exercise its expertise and judgment when implementing a policy. The ability of an agency to exercise its expertise and judgment when implementing policy. the ability of an agency to exercise its authority, I'm sorry, to exercise its own judgment and expertise when implementing a policy. Guys, usually when Congress makes a law, they're not very detailed about it, and they just tell the agency, this is what we hope to accomplish. And they give a lot of leeway to the agency to do what it takes to decide whatever they need to decide so that they can meet that policy, they can enforce that policy. Why? Why are they given so much discretion and leeway in how a policy, how a law, for example, is executed and implemented? So that we can, like, keep them very Why is it Congress saying, oh, this is what you need to do, this is what I, how I need you to enforce it? They're not experts. Because they're not experts. Who would know best how to achieve a policy goal? The experts. Congress can say we want to go to the moon, but Congress doesn't know how to do that. Who knows how to do that? The NASA does. The scientists in, in NASA does. The bureaucrats in NASA does. So they're able to exercise a lot of leeway and discretion in order to enforce or achieve whatever goal that policy wants to achieve. So that is discretionary authority. The ability of a bureaucrat to exercise his own expertise, to exercise his own judgment when he's enforcing or implementing a policy. And usually, Congress, the President, 
um, and the federal bureaucracy trust these agencies and trust these departments to know what's best and how to achieve a particular policy. Because they are the what? They are the experts. For example, let's say your car breaks down right now. What's the policy that you need? You need the car what? Fixed. You need the car fixed, right? So you can make a law that says, I need this car fixed. Are you going to be able to do that yourself? No. Some of you might, but most of you won't. Because you don't have the what? Expertise. You don't have the expertise. So who are you going to give that policy to? To a mechanic. Are you going to tell him exactly what you need, what he needs to do? No, no because you lack the what? Expertise. Your expertise. So you give him discretion, you give him leeway in how he should fix your car. Because he has the expertise. And they can take their They could. So there are some times where a policymaker, like Congress, for example, sees that one of their policies are executed the way they didn't want it to be executed. And they're sad about it because they, they, didn't, they wanted the policy to be executed, but they didn't want it to be executed the way that the bureaucracy or the agency executed it. So here's a question. If you're Congress and you want to make sure that the agency executes it to the T, to, to how you want, and you want to limit their discretion, what do you do? The money. If I was Congress, I make this policy, I make this law, but I want it to be executed the way that I want it. I want to limit their discretion so that they don't make a lot of decisions for themselves. I want them to do what I tell them to do. You put it in the law. I make my law very what? Specific. Very specific and very detailed so that they don't have any room to make decisions, so they don't have any room for discretion. Same thing for the president's executive orders. Same thing for the rulings made by the federal courts. They can make those policies very detailed, and they can tell the federal bureaucracy exactly how they want it to be enforced so that we can limit discretion. So when do they have more discretion? When the policy is what? When policy is vague. Vague, not very detailed. So to give you an example, let's say your mom is leaving for the weekend. And she gives you a policy to do. She makes a policy that says, well, you need to clean the house by the time I get back. So you need the house clean. You are the agency. You are the one in charge of meeting that goal of achieving whatever the policy wants to achieve. What does the policy want to achieve? Clean the house. Clean the house. So you can do it like a sane person, and you can do it methodically with mops and traditional sweeps and stuff like that. Or you can invite thieves to your house that they can clean your whole house. Or you can turn on your bathtubs, right, and allow a flood to come through your house. That would achieve the same goal. Is that something your parents would have wanted? No. no. So how do they limit your discretion? What you need to do. They tell you what you need to do. They tell you, <laughs> at 6 a.m. tomorrow, I need you cleaning the bathroom with this instrument. At 7 a.m. tomorrow, you should be in your room doing this. Does that make sense? All right, so that the policymakers can limit discretion, they can be very detailed about what they want and how they want it to be accomplished. So the result of discretion is it may limit the influence of policymakers over the execution of their own policy. So if the bureaucrats are exercising a lot of discretion, it's less influence for the policymakers to see how. It may limit the influence of policymakers in the implementation or the enforcement of their policy. Because you exercise a lot of authority and you invited thieves to your house, that gives your mom less influence over how the house should be cleaned. So it may limit the influence of policymakers how their policies are, in, are implemented or enforced. Any questions, guys? What happens if they just don't follow the law, like the rules that they said? So there's multiple checks that can happen? Uh, the president can come down on the leader of the agency and could do what? Fire him. Can fire him. And, or Congress can change the rules, can cut their budget, stuff like that. There's, there's checks. We'll talk about those checks later on. Any questions? No. All right. You have a homework assignment tonight? <laughs>